Hello, great ones. Welcome to the relaunching of my YouTube channel. I just completed season one during a whole pandemic of the Living Me Great podcast, and I'm transferring all the episodes over to my YouTube so that my new YouTube audience gets a dose of what my content is about. Please like, share, and subscribe, and enjoy the show. Hello, great ones. Welcome to the Live and Be Great podcast. I'm your host, Latanya Sampson McDonald. I am a life coach and a registered marriage and family therapist associate. And this podcast was created to motivate, educate, and inspire all to live and be great. On today's episode, I have yet another (laughs) conference that I did. Um, It's a series called Black Therapist Speak, and it's hosted by a Canadian therapist named Miss Kimberly Cato. Um, During this discussion, um, we had talked about trauma and the current times and how it is affecting black people during this time and what do we do as therapists there's also some information about childhood trauma and how trauma affects the body um it's very impactful okay very insightful i enjoyed um being a part of this movement called Black Therapists Speak because, you know, it's it's unique to me because the things that affect my community, being a black woman, I, it's not always in the books. It's definitely not in the textbooks. So there's extra work, extra um, avenues of healing that we have to explore because our experience as black people in America is unique, black people anywhere, really. Um, so please enjoy (laughs) it is lengthy I'm also going to leave the description in the box Um, I'm also going to split it into two parts so you'll get the first part uh, this week and then in two weeks you'll get the second part okay all right enjoy My name is Kimberly Cato, and I'm the registered psychotherapist and CEO of True Roots Counseling Services, where we purpose to come alongside people who are overwhelmed and perhaps blindsided by life-altering circumstances and give them tools and strategies designed to help them, you know, transform their trauma into triumph. Really excited for the conversation that I had with Tracy Thompson and Latanya Sampson McDonald's, two vibrant, um, phenomenal black therapists, one up here in Canada, that's Tracy, and one in the United States, um, that's Latanya. And they just shared, we had a healthy conversation actually about a myriad of things. So I welcome you and invite you to listen to the length of this conversation. Um, Be sure to, you know, like and subscribe and ring the bell. But even beyond just that, be sure to take notes and pay attention to the brilliance and the wisdom that they impart um, together. Uh, not just, you know, the, the whole purpose of the Black Therapist Speak is to give tools and strategies to people to deal with the COVID and the uh, anti-Black racism and 
the myriad and, and multitude of levels of oppression that Black people are facing. Um, we had a really interesting conversation about mental health in the Black community. And I, I just welcome you to, to take notes and to really dig in to this conversation so that you're left with the tools and the skills and the strategies you need to face the things you encounter on an everyday basis. Join me, <laughs> join us in exploring what mental health looks like in the black community. Thank you so much. Oh, ring the bell, subscribe. <laughs> Share this with other therapists, other people of color, other people that you know who may be in need of support. Share it. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hey, can you do me a favor? Can you ring the bell? Can you subscribe to this channel? Can you share this message with friends and family? Let them know. Black therapists speak. <laughs> Bye now. <laughs>
Okay. Yeah. And, and she was her mother's everything and back on, back on and back on. Mm -hmm. So having that experience and being able to bring it to the forefront and meet people where they're at um, is kind of my mission. And I've worked for um, the Victims of Crime um, in South Central LA. Uh, I've worked in Calabasas for, uh, you know, youth that are suicidal and have addiction issues. I've also worked with adults that have addiction issues from Calabasas to South Central. So it's like a different, I have a broad spectrum of different people yeah. um, that I've worked with, as well as right now I work for um, DCFS and probationary youth as a therapist. And man, the similarities is everything is related to the childhood, every last thing. Yeah. So being able to impact those different um, communities, but bring them back home to one has been extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and what brings me to um, therapists speak, black therapists speak, is I... I want to, you know, get validation for myself, but also give validation mm -hmm. from what we all feel and what kind of all, what kind of brought us all into the field mm -hmm. is the unspoken, is the what happens in my house stays in my house, mm -hmm. is the, oh, just pray it away, oh, they just a little touched, um, yeah. you know, that type of commonality and not in a shaming way, but in a way to where I could say, I see you, sis. I see you, bro. I understand. Now let's yeah. come together and try to make this make sense. Absolutely. Well said. Well said. How did, how did, um, how do you view what's happening in this era of COVID and how did that impact the work that you do? Tracy, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Tracy, we can't hear you. I think right now it's been a bit of a sliding, a sliding scale where you find people that are in extreme issues of neglect. Um, also, the fact that they've been living a very secluded life yeah and this seclusion has turned them into people that they no longer recognize yeah and yeah. you have to talk to them about the state of brokenness that they may be feeling or the state of decay yeah so the brokenness is like usually something has really declined within their life and they believe that's the problem right or if it comes to a child the child is the ip the identified patient yeah once you get into the family circle, you notice that there's a lot of more festering going on, where there's a lot more breakdown. Um, there is multiple systemic issues that have been ignored and now have turned into a state of disease. And then you're trying to amend these issues because you have to deal with the IP, which is the child, but also the festering situation. So you're putting out multiple fires, right? Yeah. And those multiple fires, a lot of times I find that the child feels the blame for, even though that may not be the identified issue that is like um, engulfing the family unit mm. or engulfing the structure if it's um second generation child living with um extended family because yeah. that a lot happens within our communities as well and yeah. just that piece is big too where you know you'll you'll hear well you know we don't really believe in therapy but we had to do this yeah or you know therapy is for for rich white people yeah. so we're just doing this because we have to so yeah. just tell me what we have to do and let us get back to our everyday lives because i have to do this and i have to be here and yeah. then you're trying to tell them well you know what it's not just because of the color of my skin is why i'm helping you it's because yeah. there's an issue so let's work together let's try to find that solution solutions come from you I help you, I'm your navigator, but the solution comes from you. Yeah. And that's big for them to know, right? Yeah. Because they feel that I'm here to judge them. And I'm like, I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to help you yeah. or aid you with your issue. Help mm -hmm. seems like a handout. I'm not here to 
give you a hand a hand out but a hand up so let's do it that way excellent excellent thank you latoya how has COVID uh, impacted you and, and the work that you do um it's well it's very difficult because i'm now back to my community so i feel like black people used to be having stuff taken away and especially working with DCFS and probationary kids, they're like, mm, right? I, I don't, I, yeah. I'm used to not having the norm. Um, but from the outside, I think it's an equalizer a little bit, yeah. right? Um, as far as having something taken away and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Um, I think the scary part is nobody knows what they're doing and nobody has the right answer yeah so that part is is also difficult um and as well as with the black community i i think you're gonna run into people who are tired of having things taken away yeah right yeah and then you have people that are just used to it and have normalized it yeah like the the ones who were protesting the ones that won't right you see what i'm saying yeah so or yeah. the ones who will be democrat or the ones who will be republican or whatever the ones that will stay in the hood or the ones that will get an education um Dang. it's definitely like other people kind of get to see what we experience basically um you know especially in the difference in the protest like you know you saw like white people going and with their guns and now i don't want to wear my mask yeah right yeah and you don't see the amount of like control and the brutality as do as you do with the black lives matter mm -hmm. protest and it's just it's just so interesting like okay you had something happen to you that you don't want to happen yeah. but you don't understand why people are fighting for their lives um and i think people are waking up right um yeah. with that i think that's why we do see more white people out there at the black lives matter um uh, protest is because man i'm being forced to actually sit and look at it yeah versus yeah. having that privilege to just uh it, it don't affect me so let me yeah. just go yeah. on about my day yeah yeah it's an that's a really interesting point too because um i i what i've noticed with covid is that um work and um you know daily activities were the things that people use to distract them from what's mm -hmm. really happening in the world and once those things were removed you you see um <laughs> you see how people are really not able to adapt to mm -hmm. um the lack of control and the things being taken taken away and the way that they rebel and resist those things mm -hmm. um i do see it as there's a cultural response to mm -hmm. the taking away of things and and i i hear what you mean um about black black people are they do sit in the two camps you know where mm -hmm. they're they're accustomed to things being taken away and the response to that will be either enough is enough i'm done with you taking things from me <laughs> um or mm -hmm. there's just this apathy there's this you know yeah yeah what else is new <laughs> right. Them, right and you, you see people um you see people fighting to figure it out um and making a way in the midst of this dry space um and and then you see others who are really struggling and really fighting and, mm -hmm. and like tracy indicated that that it becomes a layered effect in terms of the impact the traumatic impact yeah. of, of all of this and and um that's one of the reasons um that i really wanted to do black therapists speak is so that we can you know speak about the things that we can do in the midst of this circumstance and situation that some people would i mean everybody needs different things so if we have a multitude of people speaking about the things that they've done and the things that they've had success at the things that they've tried and the things that didn't quite work out so well 
then at least that's information that others can reach out to when they're trying to make sense of the madness for themselves. Um, right. So I, and when you, even when you speak about the layered effect, yeah. one of the things I think we usually kind of put to the side as black therapists is the erosion. The erosion is big. Yeah. And I feel that a lot of times when it, when the family is, isn't in a state of decay, we only see the surface level because we're so good at putting on appearances. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, we know how to hide our pain and smile and walk through that door and continue our day. And mm -hmm. It's hard when somebody of your same ethnicity, same culture comes to you and says, listen, I can see past the guys. We need to deal with the problem. <laughs> and that is big. Like, mm -hmm. I have, a, like, especially because being from Caribbean dialect and you have to speak different dialects comparing to who you have to speak to. Yeah. And then them knowing, okay, I was seeing just another black face with an education stamp, but now she's speaking to me in my dialect. Yeah. I can't mm. hide. Yeah. I can't hide from the problem because she knows. Yeah. She yeah. may not have talked to me that way at first. Yeah. But I say to my clients or families, um, yeah, I have to talk to you in this tone, but after when we get to certain points, I will be speaking to you in our dialect if I have to get something through. So yeah. understand it's going to come from both angles and we're going to target the problem because I'm not the type of therapist that sits on a problem for two years. Like yeah. no. we get yeah. down to things in the bulk of a session. Yeah. We get down to things in the bulk of a, of a, a conversation on the phone. When yeah. I ask you to yeah. fill out something, I want to know the truth. I don't want to want. I don't want to know the sugar glaze. I want to yeah. know yeah. what's really going on. Yeah, yeah, and getting really genuinely to the heart of the matter. Right. And, yeah. and that's the interesting one of the conversations that I've been having is really um, about therapists, black therapists, being available to people um, who are also identifying as black. And and um, because there was there's there's the running conversation that black people don't um, access mental health, um, mm -hmm. and and I have a theory on that. But I wonder if you can respond to that question. What what are your thoughts, Latoya, on the statement mm -hmm. that black people don't access mental health? What what do you think might be the reasons as to why? And have you ever encountered this as well? Yeah, it's Latanya, by the way. Latanya, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I, it's I'm okay, sorry. my whole life. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I used to it. But um, yes, I've definitely experienced that, right? Yeah. Um, especially when I work at a high school as a therapist. And if I see a child that used to be an A student and now they have depression, Bring your mom in here. Let me let me talk to them, right? <laughs> that's usually my go-to because that's where it stems from. And yeah. I will get the parents that will say, oh, you know, therapy for white people and, you know, just make sure her grades are okay. Like, what do you need yeah. to talk to me for? But I know how, how necessary they need to hear that validation from their parent. So I have to reach the parent. I can't just turn a blind eye to it and be like, well, you're supposed, you're supposed to know better. They don't. Because what is an adult in the first place? When we see an adult get angry or frustrated and cuss people out, does that look like an adult or does that yeah. look like a five-year-old? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what I usually do is connect to that five-year-old that can't hear the, their daughter's pain or their son's pain over their own. Yeah. Right? The one that needs that validation. See me, see me, see me. Yeah. Or, or nobody else gonna get seen right yeah. i have to give that one a voice yeah. there and i've had like clients that um were older domestic violence clients um that needed to um they wanted validation from the abuser right not validation but um yes. closure Yes, yeah. closure from the abuser. Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, no, let's go back into your history and find out why you thought that this was okay. 
Like who, 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 who confused that for you? You get what mm -hmm. I'm saying? And nine times out of 10, the history is the same. Oh, my grandmother used to get hit or my auntie's getting hit right now mm -hmm. or the relationship with my mom. Like she was yeah. very hard on me or, or my, mm -hmm. my dad was, you know, he made sure or whatnot. And my view now is different because I've been able to make the connection for them based off of our culture. And our culture is that slave mentality. I need to beat you into submission, yeah. right? Yeah. Instead of using this part. And yeah. then they're like, you know, and the first thing I get, um, but what if I have like a, a toddler and they can't speak yet and they're about to test the fire? Okay, I've seen people play with regular uh, pe babies they don't know and pretend to cry, right? Yeah. Grab their yeah. hand. Oh, ow, ow, ow. Toddlers yeah. immediately start crying, right? Yeah. Yeah. And now you already you you already are starting to allow that brain um, to prepare itself, right? To start functioning and start learning versus I need to pop you and go on about yeah. my day. Yeah. Because we back then we didn't have time. You're right. We didn't have time as slaves. We didn't have time to process our emotions. No. They snatched my children from me and I'll never see them again. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah. I need to hold on to something, which was religion, to, to, to keep going. I got to hold on to something. Back then they didn't have a choice. You're right. They didn't. Yeah. The only choice they had was to survive. But we're also carrying that pain that they didn't get to speak on. Mm -hmm. Right? And I also say to my clients that if you're a black person that is aware of what is really going on and what we've been dealing with, yeah. all y'all got depression. Every last one of y'all. If you yeah. really are looking at that, the fact that we don't sit to process with our kids that for the rest of your life, because you're a black person, you're going to be treated as less than, even though everything in your body is telling you that you're human and you should be treated as human. And there's nothing you could do about it. Yeah. Right. We yeah. don't even take the time to process that with our kids to like sit there and cry about that yeah. or anything. Yeah. We just like, okay, well, go to school, get a job and do right. Yeah. You know? So yeah. having these conversations and relating it back, it, it helps me with those yeah. clients that are like, oh no, we don't need therapy. No, it's not about you needing therapy. It's about your right to assistance. It's yeah. your right to yeah. heal your bloodline. Right. Yeah based off of the trauma that has occurred yeah you have the chance to be the answer with your healing yeah Inter you're right intergenerational trauma is so it's so significant absolutely mm -hmm. what what's your response tracy to My, um, mental health in the black community well i agree with latoya and i also agree with you yeah. um kimberly is the fact that with intergenerational trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder or post-traumatic slave disorder mm -hmm. is what um latanya was talking about sorry i messed up your name before is that okay? <laughs> um is that is a reoccurring issue within both the north american demographic the caribbean demographic and abroad and i find that especially because uh, Canada seems like a central point where people either stop through or they migrate here or they stay and they have generations of family. Yeah. I find that a lot of times you're dealing with a parent who was left by another parent mm -hmm. or you're dealing mm -hmm. with uh, a loss of a parent either through the penitentiary system or yeah. a death or an exposure to an illness that they weren't aware of until it was too late because of situational issues within the family line. So all those things lead to, again, that festering that I talked about before, that decay of the family system. Yeah. But we bounce, we bounce back, we get up. I got to go to work. My kids got to go to school. Yeah. I got to get this done. This is more a uh, need. But they don't see the erosion yeah and yeah. the erosion is big the erosion is big now to the fact that they say that covid is attacking more of people of color True. but how do we see that how can you put that into means well mm -hmm. for example there are kids of color who are afraid to put on masks yeah it's an extra barrier right i can't 
I can't associate with my peers if I have on a mask because mm -hmm. they associate me to looking like somebody that I'm already fighting not to look like. Yes. I don't want to yeah. look like that stereotype. I don't want to look like that person that teacher is going to put in the corner. Yeah. I don't want to look like that person who goes to the office. I don't want to look like that person when the cruiser passes by, yeah. he's going to flash his light and look at me first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. this there is this added embedded stigma with this with the events of masks, yeah. with the events of COVID, that is a whole different layer that hasn't even been talked about yet. Yeah. yeah. Right? You're subject you're subjugating people to the fact that, hey, you're putting on another barrier where we already have multiple barriers yeah. Yeah. that oppress us. Yeah. And this simple thing where I can't enter a store without a mask or i can't yeah. enter a public space without a mask is making me feel criminalized in a system that yeah. i'm already oppressed in and yeah. these things are big yeah and we really have to address that as therapists because yeah. i don't even think we'll even realize the shock value to the, ch the school age children because they'll have to grow up with this stigma and this oppression, right? It's very similar to when they started doing studies on black, um, dark skinned black girls and black boys, and how the tribal hierarchy of color related in different prospects of their lives. Yeah. Like that was big. And we yeah. only grazed the surface on that. Yeah. So yeah. imagine putting the emphasis of physical aesthetics on top of this mask. Yeah. What is that going to do? How is that going to oppress these children, yeah. these people growing up in color, uh, in yeah. a world that sees color first? Yeah, yeah. Very good point. Very mm -hmm. good point. Yeah. Colorism is a huge thing within the community, and it's a huge thing, generally speaking. Um, mm -hmm. We were talking um, in another, uh, the sep September 9th episode, um, just about those specific layers and how, um, you know, in, in white supremacy, that otherism is, is often, um, it becomes an internalized racism within the community because the colorism was born out of the supremacy. The um, favoritism given to the fair-skinned um, slave as opposed to the punishment given to the dark-skinned slave and the labels attached to them were really ingrained in um, African-American, African-Canadian people um, who were enslaved. And, and so when you start seeing generations after that colorism still being a, um, a thing that we actually hold within the community, and and hold against one another it's the internalized racism it's the um stockholm syndrome it's the taking on the um characteristics and behavior of the oppressor and and um turning that against um one another and um i do see that tremendously as a response um to the oppression that we and endured and lived through, um, and as um, understanding and looking at mental health in, within the Black community and our resistance to stepping out to receive it, it is, I think, multi-layered in that um, the language of mental health has always been used against us. It hasn't worked in the Black individual's favor. Um, in terms of the DSM-4, um, even, even um, the, a, a literal diagnosis being ascribed to Black slaves who um, were, had, the, had the tenacity to, to want to flee. And this is then criminalized and seen as a mental disorder as opposed to a realistic desire for somebody who's captured and held against their will. You mm -hmm. should want to flee. Um, so because um, mental health often is being written by or 
and and um, administered by the white population and the oppressor, it was often seen as something for uh, for the um, the oppressor for the white person and against the black person, and so there's a resistance sort of ingrained in us not to um, ascribe to the language and the um, practices of mental health. Um, and so, but what we need to be doing as a community is looking at the things that we do do um, tribally, culturally, um, as a community to um, create safe space, to um, alleviate and um, uh, minimize stress, the way we care for one another, the way we love on one another, the way we come together um, when things are rough. Although we wouldn't call that mental mm -hmm. health, it is mental health. Mm -hmm. It is creating safe space. It is um, alleviating and de-escalating de stress but I think we need to really work on the language. How, what's your response to, to all that? Or do you have any? My response would be, um, I'm gonna take it from a twofold approach, okay? Because I deal with clients that are from, from the, the continent, so they've never dealt with slavery. And then I also deal with um, clients that are um, originated in either the states by slavery or s clients that have migrated from the Caribbean. So it's the dysphoria on three different frames. And the dysphoria look when it kind of deal with clients that who've, ne who've come from the continent and have not dealt with slavery, but have dealt with colorism, their approach to systemics and the, the pockets within society that don't accept them, especially when it comes to therapy, is very unique. So a lot of times I've dealt with clients who have never seen a Black therapist, don't know that Black therapists get, exist, and you have to explain to them that this is just like your healing circles, okay? Think of it about your healing circles and you go to your healer, it's the same type of connection you have a talk with your healer your healer and you work out a plan and then you come to you come to an optimization of how to make that solution and then you have you have the people that born generations and they've been accustomed but they are still not a part of the main framework so you explain to them okay yes i understand that you have an appearance in your community that you need to hold up but we got to get down to these things because if you don't get down to this, you're going to have a broken glass and nobody mm -hmm. drinks out of a broken glass. Yeah. Yeah. And then also with the Caribbean, it's very interesting because then it's a lot of, it's, ab it's about religion versus culture mm -hmm. and societal oppression. And that's a very interesting mix. So taking the fact of, yes, God heals all things, but right now, God has led you to this path where you need therapy. How are you going to integrate the word with therapy? Yeah. That is big. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Coming from, um, you know, as a chaplain, I, I, uh, it, that, was an all, that was always a very interesting dance, um, the religious aspect of therapy. Um, a very interesting dance, indeed. Um, Tanya, what are your thoughts? Um, my thoughts are, um, and it's quite interesting that you guys are based in Canada. I believe I was born in Canada, but oh. by way of my parents being from Guyana, the Caribbean, um, but I live in America and I live my life as a, a I never knew what to call myself. Oh. Uh, because people just assume I'm African-American, and I'm like, I'm Canadian, so yeah. what am I, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> um, the, the labels, and basically, you, you like, you guys talked about, um, Tracy talked about dialect, right, and the language that you speak. 
Um, I've learned that it is okay to meet everybody where they're at, right? Um, And we don't, we don't have to do, we don't have to hold on to the things that are so-called true of the culture, because a lot of the things that we hold tight to the culture don't come from our culture. Yeah. Yeah. like the you know we talked about earlier oh only white people go to therapy um i remember i i even talked about this with um a gang member that i'm counseling and talked about the whole no snitching thing right Um, and i'm like you really think that came from our community look at what happens when these former police officers like blow the whistle what happens right like they get fired You see what I'm saying? Faster than anybody that committed an actual crime. Yeah. A lot of times when we see, um, you know, the police officer, you know, shooting an unarmed black person, a lot of times we do see that, oh, you just get, we just going to transfer you. And then we look at their history and they got a whole history of doing the same thing of excessive force. They have that history. So there's a lot of things um, that are placed in our community that, Mm -hmm. We have to start to unveil and let them know that just because it's white doesn't mean it's right, right? And there's certain um, situations, there's certain things, a certain aspect that like America kind of thrives off of us being broken and staying broken. Yeah. So it's certain things that we've glorified that they push on us, yes. right? To stay broken. So yeah. I always have to relate it back to myself, right? Yeah. Um, and humanize that and show that okay i can change i can wake up so can you but let's bring it to where you understand it right like even when when i always have the conversation about okay stop hitting your kids or whatnot Mm -hmm. i always okay tell me that story when you remember that whooping right because everybody remembers it that story that you can you 70 years old still remember (laughs) that time when it was a bit too much for you yeah and like we also got to be honest with ourselves when you hit it's a release you get out of there yeah right yeah and i also tell the parents like a lot of times to even strike pain to inflict pain you got to be in a sense of rage and anger right yeah so you're not only hitting them because of the shoes are out, uh, out out of place but you're hitting them because you hate your job you can't yeah. stand your spouse. You're yeah. not doing what you want to do. Yeah. And also, you can't hit back the person that yeah. abused you in your childhood. Yeah. Right? So that release comes from there. And that's not yeah. on your child. Your yeah. child didn't ask to be here. And yeah. then sometimes they say, well, I'm working two jobs. And I'm like, wait a minute. If you're a black person, you knew how this world was before yeah. you brought your child into it. Yeah. So how yeah. dare you blame them yeah. because you got to work hard. Right? Yeah. Yeah, you see what I'm saying, and because nobody normalized or let them weep about the pain of that, they're not going to hear their child say anything. You see what I'm saying? So I always try to connect it back to there, even with people who are not in our community. Yes, yes. right. Yeah, and that's another big lie because they think only black people hit their kids. No, no that's <laughs> not true. Yeah, it's not true. Yeah. And the scary, the one of the scariest things is that we've been all fed this lie of what the american dream is right even other countries have been fed the lie of the american dream get the job get the degree get the spouse yeah house get the car right yeah and you won't be happy yeah why do you see a ceo of a company jump off the 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 10th story and kill themselves yeah. Right, because that's yeah. the, I think that's the scariest, also the scariest form of depression. Yeah, is that wait, you told me that if I have all this stuff, I'll be happy. Yeah, but I'm not right, yeah. and it ha- it has to go someplace, and yeah. I think that's also like this is like a sidebar. I think the psychological aspect and the erosion and the decay, like you guys were talking about, was also missing from the civil rights movement. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't connect that part. Like you told me, right? Yeah. Go sit in at these protests, be nonviolent, let white people spit in my face, hold me down, kick me down. Yet when I come home, if my room ain't clean, you ready to knock my head off. Yes. So the anger has to go somewhere. 
And a lot of times it's on to our children and it's on to our families yeah. because we've been taught, oh, just pray about it, just push through, just hold yeah. on, but not heal from it. We can't say, yeah. okay, this person hit me and then, all right, put them in jail and you do nothing. Yeah. How do you, you have to heal from that pain or that whatever happened will look for resentment and somebody has to pay for it. Yeah. It's interesting because it, it sort of ties back to what um, Tracy was saying a little earlier about um, post-traumatic slave syndrome. Mm -hmm. Dr. Joy DeGruy talks a lot about just yes. the generational pain and, and things that come from generation to generation. And, and that much of the reason why um, we, we and, and it's one of the things that I, I really, I resist, um, but when when they talk about black on black crime mm -hmm. um, which is a misnomer because it doesn't matter where you are there's white on white crime there's Asian right. crime there's it, like you, you you the crime is inflicted um against the one with whom you you your that lies within your community so mm -hmm. if your neighbor has things and you want those things or need those things and your neighbor is of the same color as you that's the white on white white crime the black on black crime whatever the case may be um but that's just an aside um, because the, the intergenerational um pain and trauma it's really born out of whoever is put that fire in me the one who is actually oppressing me they're the powerful i cannot exercise my anger and frustration against them so i come home and the neighbor rides by in, you know on a bike that i want for my kid or um says something that disrespects me and i'm living a life with this oppressor's foot on my neck day in and day out and i cannot say anything to them but you who um are in my community and you disrespect me now respect becomes a currency for which i will die for and so you know killing and and harming those who show you that disrespect Mm -hmm. who are within your community and not the actual one to whom or with whom you're angry mm -hmm. that's where the behavior um that's where the behavior comes from there's there's a lineage and a history to it in much the same way as you're talking about the the physical punishment of children and, mm -hmm. and when you hit your child it's not the child um that is standing behind that slap or whatever there's there's a whole history behind that and it can get out of hand far too quickly yeah. which is why it's not good we need to be using the communication we need to be yes. talking with the with the individual we need to be talking number one with ourselves and understanding the history of trauma that is bringing us to this place where our our instinct is to, to act out violently that aggression is not good mm -hmm. it's not it's not good and we need to understand what what it's born out of so that we yes. can handle on that yeah mm -hmm. yeah um tracy you you um sent a powerpoint and you were going to be talking about a pow the powerpoint i'm assuming did you want to bring that up um here and talk through it well yes because we've touched a lot on uh what the powerpoint is about okay. so i think it will bring a lot more understanding to viewers if we see some of the things that we're talking about because i've given some examples oh, of when it deals with the stress and how it deals with the brain so yeah. let's get into some of that okay um let me pull this up oops get rid of that. Um, 
<laughs> um, so tell me what you would like me to, to do and how you'd like me to. I'm going to move us. Can you see me move us? <laughs> or is there somebody on my screen that I'm really happy? I don't see you. I just see you, but now I see the PowerPoint in the corner. Okay, so. I see. Okay. Whenever Tracy talks, we'll see her. Okay. So basically, the reason why I chose an arrow is because a lot of times we feel that when we we have issues with our youth as children in the family, it, it's just a one directional approach. Mm -hmm. But we don't see as as a community that the issue actually tears into two. Yeah. So there's the yeah. black approach and then there's the white approach. Excellent. So let's yeah. go into the second slide. Okay. So basically what's really been going on is the fact that we've been talking about as, as Therapists United today, about our caseloads, our outlets, the approaches within our families, our friends, and also community members. Yeah. But what are we, what are the kids actually hearing? What are the kids actually feeling? What are they actually getting to? What is yeah. their feedback from the things that they're taking in on a daily? Yeah. And I think that's the thing that we need to really um, subscribe to. As therapists right now yeah. and take their individual approach and make it more broadband mm -hmm. so we as therapists can learn from their experiences yeah yeah absolutely sorry you just um yeah. oh, analysis of the social problem okay right so we, I like the fact, one of the reasons why I did reach out to you, Kimberly, is because I like the fact that you talked about George Floyd. Yeah. But we also are forgetting the narrative that became before him. Absolutely. He is a focal point, but there are many lives and many bloodstains of families that lost an individual or a loved one yeah. or someone a part of their community and children have been hearing this silent cry and yeah. now it's an outward cry and i think right now we have to talk about the balancing okay and the, we've talked about the erosion but how do we heal that we yeah. heal that through balancing we heal that by applying tools we heal that by giving an ear to listen a shoulder to cry yeah an outlet to speak yeah sometimes it's just it's just the company we keep, right? Yeah. To letting them know that, yes, you can be heard. And then also, too, we talked about the masks mm -hmm. and the fact that they are a silent barrier that is applying a lot of social pressure on children who want to be seen for their abilities and not for the color of their skin. Yeah. So there are so many... There are so many demographics to this problem where we're looking at these things, but how do we target them all when we know as therapists, we are, we are a part of a, a healing capacity, yeah. but because ourselves, we are also oppressed. Exactly. So we're the oppressed helping the oppressed, and yeah. this is big. Yeah. And a lot of times we talk about this, but we don't know how to amend it. So yeah. I think with, especially with your, your YouTube series and us just opening the gateways of communication, yeah. we should come to viable solutions, yeah. solutions that work, solutions that are going to help us as therapists help one another yeah. because we are also the silent yes. oppressed. And yeah. we have to talk about the things that we are, are facing. Absolutely. Because we do leave we do leave conversations and sessions with post traumatic stress. Absolutely. And this is not being approached. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we combat that? How do we get through this course of suffering through this pandemic? Where yeah. are our resources yeah. to amend the oppressed? And um, this is big. Yeah. 
that's a that's a huge that's a huge point. Um, I was wa I was reading an article on Wednesday about that about you know the the increase of um, uh, demand on mental health support and and the, the demand on mental health um, workers, the therapists, and um, just how it's 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 astronomical right now. It's just and it's only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger as people rest in the knowledge that wait a minute, this thing I'm feeling isn't actually going away. I need to talk to somebody. And because we know that trauma and stress, so they have a long window. Um, and so the question really was, what are the, the healthcare professionals? What are the therapists? Um, what's in their toolbox to assist them um, with burnout, with vicarious trauma, with those things, you know, being that ear and that um, bearing that silent wit witness to the pain and trauma of a multitude of people, um, you need an outlet. And so perhaps when, when um, we finish going through the, the PowerPoint, we can discuss amongst us what our outlet, what options we are exploring to alleviate the burden of the trauma we're enduring on a regular in helping the clients. This was a really good point. So just like you led into the point that I was talking about is how toxic is stress? So imagine you have a child, but let's now paint that child a black child. So you have stress in a family before COVID, mm -hmm. and now you have stress in a family during COVID. Yeah. That stress is magnified to the 10th power. Yeah. It weakens the child's development. It weakens their sense of high alert. They're always on alert. They feel unstable. And then this now leads into systemic issues where they're unbalanced for learning. Yeah. They're unbalanced in behavior. Yeah. They're constantly in fight and flight. Yeah. And as you can see, we have the, we have the diagram of the normal brain mm -hmm. and what it looks like and the no normal firing. If Sorry. you could go back to the next one. There we go. So you see the normal firing. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> so you, you see the normal firing. Yeah. And then you see a brain affected by toxic stress. Yeah. So this is embedded stress. This is stress that's already been impacted within the cell structure mm -hmm. of a child. So this is somebody who's gone through post-traumatic stress disorder and then now is facing another traumatic event. Yes. So it's the fact that there are less healthy firing connections within the brain. Yeah. So this child is suffering on such a traumatic level, but yeah. it's not being seen because they're not already being heard. Yes, yes. And that's the biggest issue right now. Yeah. How do we fix these issues? Yeah. How do we deal with these problems? Yeah. Yeah. Invisibility, huge. Invisibility and silence, huge. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Next. So again, like I was speaking about stress, yeah. I'm also talking about the nervous system and the vagus nerve. And the fact that a lot of times we don't think that the stress that we feel is affecting us, yeah. but it is. Absolutely. It's the fact that the body is not able to navigate as quickly as it used to. Yeah. Movements are declined. Alertness yeah. is on an ultimate high. Yeah. The, Fight, flight, and freeze. I'm seeing this with a lot of children that I deal with, that the fact that they are always in this motion and I have to teach them or talk to them about being, instead of being reactive, how to be responsive. Yeah. So I have yeah. to go back to basic amends of what they were supposed to learn while they were younger children. Yeah, yeah. And the yeah. fact that I have to now fix this thing because it's always, they're always in a state of fight. 
They're yeah. always in a state of freeze. Yeah. They're always in a state of fight. Yeah. So how do you yeah. become responsive after that? If all you know is, hey, if I hear a loud sound, I need to get up and run. Yeah. If I hear yeah. a bang, I need to get duck. Yeah. Yeah. If something crashes, I got to go. Yeah. So it's, it's big and it, yeah. it's taxing. Especially yeah. because if it's been normalized for so long, how do you mend an issue that's so embedded within the system? Yes, absolutely. And it's the fact that they don't know how to be responsive from reactive or yeah. rest and digest. Yeah. These are issues. These are things that we have to look at. These are things that parents need to understand. Yeah. The parents need to understand that's the reason why when black therapists see black children, they take that extra hand and they give them the resources that they know that sometimes they cannot afford, but yeah. need so yeah. direly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you're battling stuff that, that you might be able to look on the surface and see certain behaviors, but that's just the surface. Underneath is a heightened um, and um, like a hyper vigilant system that is responding in a reactionary way to triggers and traumas and um, things that we don't see as triggers and traumas. You know, a simple um, uh, the the dropping of a of a pen on a table, a sudden loud mo noise, or a slam door um, from the wind. Like a, I have one of my bedrooms, if the window's open, the door slams, and um, you can just see the, the sudden reactionary response to a slam door. And it, it sets off an entire um, physiological reaction that is really responding not to the slam door, but to an internalized, unaddressed issue of trauma. And, and we need to have, number one, the language for that, and number two, an understanding of how to address that in our children, and dare I say, in ourselves. Um, because as much as this is applicable and speaking specifically about the children, it really is a truth for an adult as well. Um, because if this child grows up, um, that child will still have that activated um, vagus nervous system um, that they, they don't have tools to address. So oftentimes I, I work with adults who function very much like the the children that um i started out my practice with the live and be great podcast will be airing every other friday if you have truly enjoyed this podcast thank you thank you for listening thank you for giving live and be great a chance please feel free to share like give a review subscribe on which Ever platform that you're listening to right now on iTunes or Apple Podcast, Spotify, Anchor, as well as Google Play. The Live and Be Great podcast is strictly crowdfunded, so if you are interested in becoming a supporter, you can click the link in the description or you can go to liveandbegreat.com and scroll to the bottom and donate to the Live and Be Great podcast today so I can continue to give you good and motivational content. Thank you all for listening. And don't forget to give yourself permission to live and be great. You made it to the end. Thank you so much for tuning into my YouTube channel, Live and Be Great. 
This channel will produce content that is both podcast and on screen style. So if you're interested and you enjoyed today's show, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. See you soon.